Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Bridget Kennedy with CDFW. Um, I run the NAS program, which is Archery in the Schools. Um, and I also work with R3 Efforts. For those of you not familiar with R3, it is uh, the recruitment, retainment, and reactivation of hunters and anglers in California. Um, so we want to thank you so much for joining us today for CDFW's fourth R3 Harvest Huddle Hour. Um, we have a great discussion plan for today on Tackle Box Basics. Uh, we're hoping to provide you with some helpful tips and get you excited about different types of tackle and how to match the when, where, and what species. Um, some quick housekeeping uh, for all our attendees. Um, we recently uh, were informed that the International Sportsman's Expo has been canceled for 2021 due to COVID. Um, so unfortunately, ISD will be unable to provide tickets for those 18 and over uh, who attend two or more of, of the harvest huddle hours. Uh, CDFW is currently trying to determine kind of what an alternate event might look like. So um, we'll try to keep you all up to date, uh, um, updated on that as we move along. Um, we appreciate your understanding during these unprecedented times and we'll continue the R3 harvest huddle hours so you can have access to the valuable information for your hunting, fishing, and foraging endeavors. Um, we ask that during the presentation to please keep your videos and mics um, muted. Um, please submit questions through the chat box. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end, but questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation by using that chat icon. So for those of you new to Zoom, the chat icon is, it looks like a little speech balloon on the bottom uh, bar of your screen. So you can click on that, type in your question and hit enter. Uh, questions cannot be viewed by anyone watching the presentation, only by the moderators. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, and while we're really excited to get your questions, um, please note that we will not be able to answer kind of uh, rules and regulation law related questions during the Q&A because state, county, and local laws can vary substantially when it comes to types of fishing and species. Um, so instead, we encourage you to check out CDFW's R3 page and click on the fishing tab for more information. We'll also be sending out an email later today with helpful resources and links in case we're unable to get to your question, or if you did have some rule and regulation questions that you wanted to ask, um, we can provide you with that additional information if we're not able to get to it in the Q&A uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, the video recording of this R3H3 will be available on YouTube under the CDFW R3 channel. Um, usually we try to get it up within about a week. Um, also, I noticed that in the registration survey, a lot of people um, had asked questions regarding fly fishing. Um, we're not going to touch on fly fishing as much today, but we will be having another R3 harvest huddle hour that will focus specifically on fly fishing uh, coming up in the near future. Um, we're fortunate to have two CDFW employees here with us to resign on how to pack your tackle box. With us is Robin Bilski a senior environmental scientist. Um, Robin has worked for CDFW and other natural resource agencies for several decades. Um, she returned to the department last year, we're so excited to have her, and is the statewide coordinator for the California Monitoring Plan. Um, Robin started fishing with her dad when she was five, and she's been an avid angler ever since. Uh, Robin's gonna be going over freshwater tackle with us today, so welcome Robin. Um, also with us is Andrew Hampton, another one of our amazing environmental scientists with CDFW's fisheries branch. Uh, Andrew grew up fishing the Southern California bite, chasing corbina and surf perch along the beaches, uh, jumping on a half day boat for barracuda and sand bass, um, or finding his way on board an overnighter to chase yellowtail and white sea bass at the islands. Um, he will be discussing saltwater tackle, tackle with us today. Welcome, Andrew. All right, so thanks again, you guys, for joining us. Um, so Robin's gonna go ahead and start us off with the freshwater tackle. Take it away, Robin. All right, thanks so much, Bridget. I appreciate that introduction. Um, just gonna go ahead and uh, start up my presentation. Um, so yeah, um, Again, like Bridget said, uh, I'll uh, just be covering the tackle box basics for freshwater fishes. 
Um, and so before we start today, um, you know, and really dive into the tackle box basics, I just kind of wanted to review our rod reel and line love connections. It was briefly covered in a previous R3H3 session. So if you missed it, uh, the link is available on the R3H3 page. Um, but anyhow, if you look on your fishing pole, you should see some uh, recommended ranges of tackle specifications like pictured on this slide here and the the red circled area. Um, anyhow, yeah, on the left, what you'll see is that six to 14 pound line is uh, recommended to use with this particular rod. So your reel will also have some recommended range of line specifications. And you just want to make sure that the line that you're using falls within, you know, the specs for both your rod and your reel. If you're starting out brand new right now, what I'd recommend for just basic inland freshwater fishing is six or eight pound test should cover most of these uh, overlapping um, species that you'll find below here. So that includes uh, rainbow trout, channel catfish, carp, bass, and a variety of pan fish. So yeah, that's what we're really going to be focusing our basics on today is, you know, what to use to catch those species. Um, so yeah, today this is kind of what uh, we'll be covering. Um, and in addition, I'm going to have some fun trivia questions along the way. All right, so speaking of, here's our first trivia question. What size line did I use to catch these cutthroat trout? Um, is it A, one pound test, B, six pound test, C, uh, 40 pound test, or D, I did not catch these fish? Um, yeah, so before I go over the answer, if you look to the right here, you'll see that these fish probably weigh somewhere between one and two and a half pounds. Um, so that's a hint. And the correct answer is both B and D. I did not catch all these fish. I only caught two, so it was a bit of a trick question. But um, uh, all four fish were caught with six pound line and the reason one pound test wasn't used is because the larger ones probably would have snapped it uh, and 40 pound test wasn't used because it's way too big for my trout or inland fishing gear. All right so moving on to tackle boxes there are a variety of things that you can use to store your tackle. Um, to the far left what you might recognize the classic tackle box um, and it's great for any drive to lake, but if you want to hike to like the other side of the lake or along a stream, you might want to consider a tackle bag. Um, it's a lot more portable um, and tackle trays are often included inside these tackle bags, but if not, you can buy them individually. And if you plan to go for a long hike up to a high Sierra lake, you could throw a couple tackle trays just into your backpack. Uh, and finally, on the far right, if you're creative and thrifty, you may be able to make your own tackle tray. This one was made from an Altoid box, Altoids box, and uh, my friend uses it for backpacking, and it's free if you like Rethmans and Princesses. All right, so now we'll cover line and swivels. Uh, hopefully you already have line on your reel, which is referred to as the main line. Um, but you'll also need a little extra to tie your setups, which is referred to as the leader. It's circled in red right here. Um, and I recommend that this line is the same size um, or just a little lighter than your main lines, because if you get stuck, um, you'll want your line to break towards the end of your setup so you lose less gear. Um, there's also swivels are really important to tie off of your main line to tie or clip your setups to. So um, I recommend using a general barrel swivel or um, a swivel with a clip so you can easily change out your setups. Um, and this is a, a quick video just showing how you can put a lure onto a clip swivel. Um, and similar to hooks, swivel sizes are a bit confusing because the higher numbers reflect smaller swivels while the lower numbers um, are actually the larger swivels. Uh, the size that you see pictured in this video right here is a size seven swivel. It's a great kind of general freshwater fish sized swivel um, and it's great to attach your lures to. All right. So moving on to hooks and weights. Um, you can use single or treble hooks. I'd recommend the single hooks for natural baits like worms or minnows. And again, 
similar to those uh, swivels, the higher the hook size, um, it corresponds to smaller hooks, while the lower number corresponds um, to those larger hooks. So it's a bit confusing, but um, for freshwater fish, I'd recommend using between uh, number six, um, right over here to the left, and that'd be great for panfish. Um, and then if you wanna go all the way up to like a big bass, you can use a one-aught. Um, and put like a whole night crawler on that hook. Um, treble hooks are useful when fishing with like doe baits or salmon eggs because you have extra hooks to help that bait stay attached. So I would uh, recommend um, using the sizes pictured to the right if you're gonna use treble hooks. Um, and again, uh, the larger numbers are gonna be more appropriate for the smaller fish like small trout and the smaller numbers are gonna be better for like a large catfish. Um, so to the right, weights are helpful for casting, keeping your bobber upright, or keeping your bait on the bottom. So I recommend uh, purchasing some assorted split shots, which are removable, and they help with casting and keeping your bobber upright. I'd also recommend getting some larger slip or casting sinkers, um, and they'll help with keeping your bait at the bottom or casting. Um, and you can attach those above or to the swivel directly. All right, so you've probably all seen the classic bobber setup at one time or another, um, and they're very useful for fishing um, bait or flies near the water surface. So if you see a lot of fish uh, active on the water surface, I think a bobber could be really helpful. Um, and to the right, uh, smaller floats can be uh, used to lift your bait off of the bottom um, of a lake or a stream. So um, you can use these little foam floats pictured, to the, uh, pictured in the bottom right, or you can use things like mini marshmallows, which pair well with hot cocoa in the winter. Um, but I have to admit, they don't stay on as well as the foam floats. They're just more fun and delicious. Oh, looks like it's time for another trivia question. So what type of weights did I need to catch these rainbow trout? Was it A, a casting sinker, B, split shots, C, a bowling ball, or D, I did not catch these fish? And the correct answer is split shots. Um, although a casting sinker would have worked, I didn't really need it because I wasn't casting. I was ice fishing and just dropping my line straight into the little hole that I drilled. Um, a bowling ball wouldn't have worked because, uh, well, it probably wouldn't have even fit in that hole that I drilled. Um, but hey, I actually did catch the fish this time. All right, so now we'll go over different types of uh, bait and how to set it up. So we'll start with the classic earthworms, which are free if you have a shovel in a yard. You can also use red worms, mealworms, wax worms, um, and they're used to catch nearly all the freshwater fish species. Um, you can fish with them on the surface or the, towards the bottom. Um, and then uh, salmon eggs are great for trout, and you can also fish with them on the surface of the bottom. Uh, does or scented baits are used for trout, carp, catfish, and panfish, and generally used for bottom fishing. They'll usually float. You might not even need a foam float when you fish with them. Um, and then finally, that you can use live or dead minnows, um, but it'd be really important for you to check the rules and regs if you do plan to use those live minnows, because um, sometimes they're not allowed, and in other lit bodies of water, um, the only minnows that are native to that particular water body uh, can be used. Um, to the right, you'll see some typical setups used for fishing on the surface or the bottom, and some of this tackle should start looking familiar to you now. Um, you know, the picture on the top shows a, a bobber um, and then a couple split shots below it to keep it upright and at the end a single hook with a worm uh, and that's a great setup for the surface um, and then if you want to fish towards the bottom this picture on the bottom shows a typical setup you've got your swivel and a casting weight attached to that swivel and then uh, about 12 inches of line and then uh, a nice little foam float to keep your worm up and a single hook with the worm all right so um, next, uh, if you wanna be more active when you fish, you can use lures um, or spinners uh, or soft plastics. Uh, and they're used to imitate worms, minnows, or other prey items. With this setup, you'll do a lot of casting and retrieving. Um, 
And on the top right, you'll see how simple it is to set up lures or spinners. You just tie a snap swivel to your main line and you're pretty much ready to go. Um, and on the bottom, you'll see a, a typical setup for soft plastics, which is also referred to as a Carolina rig. Uh, it's very similar to a bottom fishing setup. Um, and uh, a lot of people like to use these uh, for bass. They're very effective. All right, so for those of you who might be interested in trying to fish with artificial flies, but you don't have a fly rod, well, I have really good news because you can also do this using your conventional rod uh, for fly fishing. So um, what you would need to go uh, purchase is a casting bubble um, and that would go above your swivel and then you can fill it with water to add weight for the casting. Um, some great starter flies to trail below that, that um, swivel and casting bubble would be woolly buggers. They're great for targeting not only trout, but bass and panfish. Um, you can also use mayflies, caddisflies, nymphs, beetles and ants. Those are some great starter flies. And in the middle, there's a picture here with some examples of those flies. Uh, on the left down here, you've got your woolly buggers. In the middle, you've got your nymphs. And on the right, you've got a few of your classic mayflies. Uh, and this picture on the right here is uh, actually a West Slope cutthroat trout that I caught with a mayfly in its mouth. All right, it looks like it's our third and final trivia question. Um, what kind of fish did I use to make this delicious appetizer? Was it A, carp? B, largemouth bass, C, smoked trout, or D, I didn't make this dish, I'm not that fancy. Um, so a little hint um, here is that you'll notice that the meat is pinkish. Um, all right, so the correct answer is both C and D. Um, I did actually smoke the trout, but uh, my fancy friend made this appetizer. I don't really even know what it is, but it's really pretty. All right, so now we have a list of your tackle box basics, um, which I went over, but I didn't cover the accessories on the bottom. And I'd highly recommend purchasing some needle nose pliers uh, that you can use for removing hooks and crimping barbs. Line clippers, which could just be your basic nail clippers, all save your teeth. And um, I'd, I'd highly recommend that for cutting line. And a stringer is always nice when you catch fish. Um, so depending on how you want to fish, you may just want to purchase some of these basics. Um, if you're, uh, I just like to chill and read the paper and want to fish with bait, then you'll just need these uh, basics. Um, but if you're somebody that can't sit still, then you know maybe you'll just want to focus on purchasing the artificials. Um, and finally, if you're somebody who can't decide what to do, you know you can buy it all uh, slowly or all at once, but you know it'll give you a lot of options. All right, so um, where do you get these tackle box basics? Well, you can um, get a lot of them, as I mentioned, in your home or your backyard. Uh, but uh, you could also visit your, for the rest of them, your local tackle, bait, or fly shop. Um, they are uh, great with customer service and can give you a lot of good local information and tips. Uh, you could also go to a larger box store that specializes in fishing and hunting, which is um, likely to have a good selection, or you can try a bo big box store with hunting and fishing section or online. All right. So uh, finally, and most importantly, where will you go to use these tackle box basics? Well, I highly recommend, and I personally use this, um, going to the CDFW fishing, online fishing guide. Uh, if you just Google that, it'll come up. If not, you can visit this link, and I'll make sure that Bridget provides it to you. Um, but yeah, uh, what will happen is um, it'll bring up this great map of California and you can zoom into your area of interest and then click on one of those little um, blue triangles and it'll bring up uh, the lake or a stream that you may want to fish and it'll tell you all about what fish are present, um, which, uh, which dates it was planted on, if it's planted. Um, uh, uh, more information about the particular body of water, links to driving directions, and even links to the rules and regs. So it's a really cool um, tool. I use it all the time. I uh, highly recommend it. Here's another look at it. Um, this is Jenkinson Lake, and you can see that this lake was planted in uh, late um, spring and early summer of 2020. 
Um, and so that's all I have for you today. Thanks so much for joining me for the freshwater basics. Um, I will turn it over to Andrew now, and he's going to cover the saltwater tackle box basics. Are you ready, Andrew? I'm ready. Nice job, Robin. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, that was awesome. Thank you very much for sharing, Robin. Let me set up my presentation here. All right. How's that? We're not seeing it yet, Andrew. Okay. Why not? <laughs> Oh, here it is. Okay. How's that? Can you guys see it yet? Not yet. All right, hold on. Let me see what's going on. Oh, here we go. How's that? There we go. Yep, and just I put it in presentation. There we go. Perfect. Are we good? We're caught up? All yep, right. thank you. Awesome. Sorry for the technical difficulties there. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you, Robin. That was an awesome presentation. I appreciate you showing us the way to um, navigate the freshwater world in our tackle boxes. I'll take over here for the saltwater fishes. Um, my name is Andrew Hampton. I work for the department. And I'm going to kick it off here with this beautiful shot of one of my favorite islands. I don't know if anyone recognizes this. Um, there's a lot of white sharks there. I call it Jurassic Park, it's Guadalupe Island, and it's an amazing place if you can visit. Um, so let's get started. So we'll talk about some overview here. Uh, we'll go into bait, one of the most important things when you're going fishing, and then ways to fish that bait, the rigs you might use uh, for different kinds of bait, and what rigs you would use for certain situations. We'll talk about tackle storage, uh, whether you're just running down to the beach after work for a few hours, or whether you're jumping on a boat for three to 21 days. Uh, we'll talk about non-tackle essentials, things that folks don't really think about when they get out and go fishing and they get out to the spot. And they're like, oh wait, my sunglasses. Um, things are gonna make your fishing trip a lot more enjoyable. We'll talk about shore-based fishing, uh, beaches, piers, jetties, and then we'll go into kayak fishing and then offshore, whether you're on a charter uh, with a bunch of folks or you're jumping on a buddy's private boat. Uh, maybe you have your own boat and wanna learn more about how to fish off them. Uh, and then we'll get into the fun part, preparing your catch and how to put some tasty meals together. So what do we do? We got so many bait options. Do we want to go buy bait? Sure, no problem. You can get frozen anchovies, frozen sardines. You can buy a box of frozen squid like we got here. Um, it's available at your favorite local tackle store, um, gas stations, some markets even sell stuff that you can use for bait. Um, there's also kind of pseudo bait like the Berkeley Gold products, which are really nice because you can keep them in your tackle bag, tackle bag or tackle, tackle box. And uh, as long as they don't leak all over your stuff, you're set. Um, and they last a long time. They last really well on the hook. I think they actually last better on the hook than certain baits do, and they get bit pretty well. Um, let's say you don't want to buy bait. You want to you know, get a little more creative or you want to take the live bait approach, which I recommend. You can go ahead and make your own bait. We got a sabiki rig over here. They come in various sizes. Um, depending on the bait that you're targeting, you're going to use a different size sabiki rig, and these are super easy. The only hard part about these is storing them. Basically, you just clip your weight onto the bottom swivel that's in the bag, and you pull it out, and then you have your hooks. You drop it over the side, and you target anchovies, shiner perch, sardines, smelt, um, any number of small bait fish uh, that are accessible in your area. Um, if you're fishing the beach, you can just go along, dig your toes in the sand as the water is receding, and you'll see little holes, little sand crabs are digging down. You can plug a couple of those guys out of the sand, pin them on a hook. They're great bait for most things that live in the surf, particularly corbina and surf perch. Um, if you wanna get fancy or if you have a rake, you can use a sand crab rake and you can more efficiently dig out some live sand crabs and uh, just store them on hand. <clears throat> Especially if you find some soft ones, they do really well. Uh, if you're fishing from a pier, you can harvest some mussels, crack those open, put them on a bait holder hook like the hooks that Robin had showed. Um, you can find some shore crabs on the jetty. They're real fun to fish. The big perch like them, particularly if you're fishing up north. north. Um, or you can go pump up some ghost shrimp um, if you're so inclined. Those are awesome bait as well. So there's options here. 
Um, so here we have some bait rigs. Here on the left, there's a number of rigs that are already ready to go. You can just buy them. Again, you take your swivel, just how Robin showed. You just hook the swivel up to the top of the loop here. You have your weight somewhere above there if that's what you're using. And it's pretty plug and play. You're ready to go. These are relatively affordable. Uh, there's a number of sizes. You can have two hook rigs. You can have halibut rigs, depending on what it is that you're fishing for. There's probably something that's pretty plug and play and ready, easy for you to go. And a lot of them are snelled, which is oftentimes better for certain bait presentations. Um, and then over here, we have the sand crab I was talking to you about. Um, just various ways to hook them, sand crab, shore crabs, and then sardines up here. Um, you can nose hook these guys. You can do a shoulder hook. You can do uh, pelvic fin hook. There's a number of ways to hook your live baits. Um, and then there's a trap rig down here, which I particularly like if you're using a bigger bait, going after bigger fish like lingcod. Let's say you catch a small rockfish and, you know, you want to send it back down. You just put the J hook right through his nose, put the treble hook somewhere about two thirds of the way back on the body, tuck it in, send it back down. It's hard for a lingcod to resist a small blue rockfish on the bottom dangling in front of his cave. But you got to remember that if you do use a rockfish, it does, for bait, it does count as part of your total rockfish um, bag limit. So keep that in mind. Here, we'll talk about uh, some of my favorite rigs, <clears throat> particularly if you're fishing the beach um, or from a jetty or a pier or something, you can tie up this drop shot rig that's super easy and super efficient to fish. Um, it keeps your bait up off the bottom, especially if you're fishing a weed line. Let's say there's some weeds that are I don't know, eight to 10 inches, you can rig your drop shot so it's just above that weed line and you can stay snag, you know, free of weeds, snag free. Um, you can fish them weedless. There's a number of ways to do it. Just go online, look up drop shot knot and uh, you can fish flukes, it's, uh, swim baits, you can fish anything that way. Um, another favorite of mine, which Robin talked about earlier, is the Carolina rig. Super easy. Um, really like it in the surf when you're fishing like a, a perch grub or something. Um, you just need a half to a, you know, one ounce egg sinker, depending on uh, how, you know, the surf is where you're fishing or how much weight you need to get out. Um, fish finder rig, great. You can, you know, post up on the beach, cast out some dead bait and just let it soak uh, with a pyramid sinker. Or you can fish this uh, drifting out of your kayak with a live anchovy or a live sardine on the end. And you can just feed, you know, uh, line out as you have to. Um, dropper loops, another popular one. This is, I mean, off the kayak, you can also fish this off the beach. This is the go-to rig for rockfish fishing. You can fish two hooks at once. Um, a lot of times double dropper loop with shrimp flies is the go-to rig if you're chasing rockfish and uh, even just fishing bait, a number of other, you know, types of fishing. <clears throat> Easy to tie and uh, get you get you fishing. All right, so moving on to tackle boxes. So tackle boxes can be, you know, pretty much anything you can get your tackle in that gets you on the water and gets you out there fishing. As you can see on the left here, you can use a crate or a bucket, uh, any number of things. That's cheap and easy. You probably have a bucket somewhere in your garage, throw a bunch of stuff on it. You can even put a lid on it and you got somewhere to sit while you're fishing or going out to the grounds, not a problem. Um, here on the right, I've got some of my favorites. Bottom right here, we've got a, uh, fanny pack, which I like for surf fishing. If I'm just going out after work or for a few hours in the morning, I don't need a ton of gear. Let's say I just have a couple spoons and some pointers and some grubs. I can just throw that on. I can just walk up and down the beach. I don't feel inhibited at all. Um, and I can even put a second rod kind of like in the belt and I can have a second rod on me if I want to fish two different rigs. Um, and like I say, you don't need much tackle and you're very mobile. If I'm going on a you know, crab rockfish combo or a striper halibut trip out of San Francisco, and I'm just going for a day, I'll take this waterproof backpack and I'll take two trays and I'll just take the two trays that are appropriate for that trip. I'll throw them in there. It's got a roll top on it. It won't be an issue. Um, it's waterproof. I'm not concerned about um, what, you know, leaving it on the deck and it getting wet or the hose going. Um, that won't be an issue. And then I've got my bigger box here that will help when uh, I'm going on a longer trip. Let's say I'm going on something that's uh, like a three to, oops, sorry, oh, sorry, <laughs> there we go. 
Um, if I'm going on a longer trip, that's like three to seven days. Uh, oh, sorry. If I'm going on a longer trip, three to seven days, I can have all my stuff in here uh, on hand. Um, and then I have my bigger boxes or bags here that have everything that I won't need um, for the entire time. So non-tackle essentials. Uh, boots are number one. I always have my boots with me on a trip, uh, whether I'm fishing off the shore or off the jetty and there's slippery rocks or something. Um, I wanna make sure, you know, if a wave comes up, I don't wanna get my socks wet, ruin my fishing day or whatever. Um, I've also got my sun kit, I call it. Uh, I got at least two different hats um, that I have, sunglasses, sunscreen, um, a hooded sun shirt, which is great. If it's hot out, it can keep me just a little bit cooler. And if it's cold out, it can keep me a little bit warmer. Um, and then my cutters, duck bills and needle nose and a tuna spike, which helps for dispatching a fish once it comes aboard. Uh, you wanna be relatively humane about it, dispatch your fish quickly, clip a gill, let it bleed out. And then that allows for your catch to be prime and what you need, you know, you want to take care of this fish as best you can uh, so you can eat something uh, good later. Take care of your catch. So now we'll get into shore based fishing, actual fishing here. Um, like I said, surf fishing is great. You just got to go to a beach, it's pretty easy access. There's bait at the beach waiting for you. You can dig up sand crabs. You can find uh, blood worms at your tackle store. They're great. Sometimes they're hard to find, but they can be really good bait. Uh, clams are great also, especially if you're just casting out and being sessile uh, in one spot. You can do perch grubs, which are probably my favorite. Um, spoons are fantastic. Crocodiles, halibut and stuff, love them. Even bigger perch. Pointers are great. Um, piers and jetties are really nice because they're free to fish. If you're surrounded by water on three sides, a pier or a jetty, you don't need a fishing license um, if you're over 16 years of age. Uh, so it's a really nice way to get into fishing and uh, just get out on the water. You can use flukes uh, anyway, you know, drop shot, like I said earlier, you can use swim baits and anchovies, mussels, shore crabs all work great. And from the beach and from the pier jetty, you can also use crab snares or rings, um, which are a lot of fun. You just put bait in this little trap here, snares go out and you give it five, 10, maybe 15 minutes, depending on how many crabs there are. If you pull real hard, it'll cinch up all the snares and then you reel it in. Hopefully you got a legal sized Dungeness or rock crab on there, depending on where you're fishing or crabbing. So kayak fishing. This one's a lot of fun too, easy access. You just gotta find a nice beach that's protected and allows you some cover to launch. Um, rockfish flies, if you're fishing the North Coast, uh, targeting rockfish, uh, swim baits, uh, jigs. You can fish live bait. If you're fishing somewhere in a bay like San Francisco or Tamales, use your sabiki. Uh, if you have a live bait tank on board, you can put some sardines and anchovies down and you can use uh, this fish finder rig I mentioned earlier um, and just kind of bounce along the bottom and live bait, you know, bounce live bait for a halibut. And it's a pretty surefire way and a really fun way to fish for them. Um, <clears throat> These are some fish uh, I've cut off my kayak. Cabazon, caught on a swim bait down here. Nice cabazon, rockfish, caught jigging. Um, particularly like jigs where I can put my hook on the top side because if you are, if you're fishing for rockfish, you're fishing in the rocks and if you're getting stuck, you're in the right place because that's where they live. So by having your hook on top, uh, you'll actually lose, hopefully lose less gear. And then the vermilion rockfish. So I'd like to say I'm usually going after when I'm out there. Uh, offshore fishing. Now, my personal favorite, uh, I think it's the most exciting type of fishing, whether you're jumping on a charter boat uh, out of San Diego for one and a half to three days chasing bluefin, yellowfin, or yellowtail. Um, you know, you were, I have that big box I showed you earlier, but the majority of the fish that we catch on these trips are using live bait, which means it's just a bear hook and a piece of line. And a lot of times if that line, a lot of times if that line is fluorocarbon, uh, you're going to have a better chance. It's got an invisibility factor the fish can't see. It also has an associated abrasion resistance to it. Um, for school size fish, 25 to 40 pound is fine, uh, fluorocarbon. And if you fish anywhere from three to 25 feet of it, that's kind of a personal preference. Uh, also depends on the bite. 
but there's two types of hooks. You can use a J hook for most fishing that we do out here. Uh, circle hooks help because it helps ensure that you get a corner of the mouth hook set on those fish. Also, if you're fishing, catch and release, um, you don't really want to release something that has a J hook in the gills or, uh, you know, hadn't swallowed a hook. Um, if you can put a circle, if you have a circle hook that has a ring on it, it allows the bait to move a little bit more freely and it might help entice a bite of a more picky fish. Um, and then getting real fun is when we start fishing poppers and surface iron presentations like this, when you roll up on a school and you see the fish on the surface and they're, you know, in kind of a frenzy, you can fish them with a surface presentation and seeing them come out of the water and hit the lures on top is probably the most exciting fishing there is. Uh, when the fish are holding deeper in the water column, you can use these yo-yo irons and jigs to target tuna and yellowtail. Um, and yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of ways you can target these fish depending on where they are and what their behavior at the time is. So really go fishing, end of the day, um, get on the water, remember to be a responsible steward. You know, this is our resource that we share. Um, if you are going fishing, do your research, you know, look at the tides. If you're going to the beach, you know, you got your tackle box set up, you put your time into that. You might as well put your time into looking at the tides. If you like fishing the top two hours of the high, focus on that. Um, try and, you know, if you fish the same spot, look for holes and see what the landscape is like out there. Uh, support your local tackle shop. You know, you've got a local tackle shop probably near you somewhere. Go in there, you buy some tackle, ask them some questions. Just be like, hey, I'm going down to, you know, I'm going down to the South Jetty or something today. You know, do you have any recommendations? They all are fishermen themselves most likely and would be happy to talk to you. And it's all about time on the water, um, in terms of the prop. The more time you spend on the water, uh, the more you're gonna learn. Um, so just get out there and go fishing, you know, be responsible, do your research, and most importantly, take care of your catch. I think if you take care of your catch, it will take care of you. Uh, like I said, dispatch your fish, ice it. Um, you know, if, if you, Kill your fish quickly, bleed it, take care of it, put it on ice, take it home, fillet it, and cook it. You will be very happy um, with what you can get. Uh, we've got some sushi, a sushi platter here on the left with some bluefin and yellowtail, some collars, uh, whole rockfish cut off my kayak. Um, yeah, all kinds of fun treats. And that's all I got. Thanks, Andrew and Robin. All right, so we'll have Robin come on in and we'll do some Q&A. Got some great questions that came in. Um, Robin, too, thanks for the Q&A in your uh, presentation. I saw a lot of chat going on and people like had the right answers. All Although, right. No one guessed that you didn't catch the fist or you didn't cook it. So, but you know, that was nice of you to be to do the q and I think people enjoyed that. And then uh, Andrew, too, thanks for mentioning, like, all the different rigs. Like, I actually had, I didn't know that there was, like, specific, like, there was rigs already specifically made for certain species, like halibut, that are already prepared and ready to go. So that's yeah. awesome to know as well. So we do, we had a bunch of questions come in for you guys. So, um, so for either, either of you, this first question, it's a three-parter. Uh, what is the point of a swivel? Do I really need it? And do you find that swivels and snap swivels affect lure presentation? Well, I, I can go ahead and take care of that one, Bridget. Andrew, is that cool? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, the point of a swivel is really to give you some versatility and changing your setups quickly. Um, and then at times you're going to want the weight to stay above your leader. So that swivel will stop it. Um, so I think it's helpful for that. Um, but does it change your presentation? Do you have to have it? You don't have to have it. Um, if you're fishing with just the lure or spinner, you could tie it directly to your main line. Um, I just like it because I switch out my lures a lot. Um, but yeah, you don't have to. And then also, does it affect presentation? Well, my experience has been I get really bummed if I lose my swivel because then I have to tie directly. And I don't catch any more fish tying directly. So I just prefer this. Awesome. Thanks so much. And then, um, Robin, uh, you had showed a glass bead in your line setup. Uh, what is that for? 
So that's the Carolina rig. And um, I think it's just kind of a good stopper before it hits the swivel. You know, you saw the bullet weight that's supposed to slide back and forth. Uh, that bead's there to just kind of stop it. Awesome, thanks. And then for uh, casting bubbles, uh, can they be used for saltwater fishing? And why would you use it instead of a weight? Well, um, as far as why would you use it instead of a weight, I can answer that one. And uh, I would um, I, I would use the uh, casting bubble because it keeps your flies up on the surface. And a lot of times you catch fish on the surface um, when you're fly fishing. Um, if you used a weight, um, you might get that fly stuff on the bottom. It'd be a little harder, um, especially if you used a big weight, not to get stuff. Awesome, thanks. And then uh, this one's for Andrew. Uh, do crab snares work in SoCal water or is it primarily a NorCal thing? I have only really use them up north. I don't know the regulations. There's not much Dungeness crab distribution down south depending on where you're calling Southern California waters. I primarily use them up north, San Francisco Bay and up where I'm usually targeting Dungeness crabs. I don't know the regulations, but I don't think you can take lobster using a snare. Not sure though. Regular question. Yeah, that's the rules and regs. We'll we'll get that info out to folks. Um, is there a limit to the number of hooks that you can put on a dropper loop rig? Yeah, for it depends on the species you're fishing for. But if you're fishing for rockfish, you can fish two hooks. Um, I know other fisheries like sand dabs. I believe you can use more hooks. Um, but yeah, dropper loops, two rigs or two hooks. Sorry. Awesome. And then. Um, What's a ringed hook? So a ringed hook is basically just a hook that has a welded ring on it. So instead, when you tie directly to the eye of the hook, what happens is you have a static connection to your bait, if you will. If you have a ringed hook, you tie directly to uh, the ring. And what that allows is uh, that bait has more movement and flexibility. Like it, it, it presents more naturally. So I think when fish are finicky, or they're not really biting as well, and you have this this bait that's moving more freely, um, I think you might have a better chance of getting a bite. And again, that's case by case. Some folks believe it more than others. But if you look at like fly fishing, a lot of fly fishing guys will actually tie a loop knot, and it's the same idea. You tie a loop knot so that you allow that bait or fly to kind of like move more naturally. And I think the same goes for ring hooks. Awesome, thanks so much. And then um, someone asked kind of a, an interesting question, I think, what gear and baits are like most suitable for like choppy water versus calm water? Like, do you, do you trade out what gear or bait or lure or anything that you're using depending on how the water's moving? Sure. Yeah. Um, a lot of times there's this old adage that <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, it, folks say, you know, fish, darker colors, purples, blacks, and stuff when it's overcast or in the morning or before the sun's really high. And then once the sun's high, you can transfer it over to those uh, brighter colors. Um, similarly, if we've had, you know, a big storm or runoff or something like that, where there's different baits in the water, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, there was a big storm and it maybe shook some stuff up and there's more inverts in the water than there would be at some point. Maybe certain baits will work better because fish are used to seeing them because there's been a recent disturbance. Uh, so it might be good to try something that you wouldn't usually try in a case like that. Okay. And this actually kind of leads into the next question is, is in what scenario um, could your rod and gear setup be used potentially for both salt and freshwater fishing? Like, is there a certain species that kind of crosses over or anything like that? Sure, I, yeah. I've, Go ahead, Robin. Oh, sorry, I mean, I've seen, uh, I've, I've gone out on a halibut boat before and um, the guy that did the best on that boat was using his bass rod. So um, you can, um, but I'd be careful if you're gonna use your freshwater for salt water. Usually they're not built to handle a lot of the salt, like the components. But sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, that's very true. And that actually makes me think of something else. Definitely. And if you do take your freshwater gear, which you're used to using in freshwater, if you take it into the salt, remember the salt is a lot harder on your freshwater gear. It's a lot harder on all your gear. So you got to rinse your gear and wash it and take care of it well after you use it in the freshwater. It's not going to last you nearly as long. And totally, I have rods and reels like uh, rods that I use for fishing, stripers in the rivers to throw big swim baits, all 
throw similar swim baits for rockfish and lingcod in the salt water all the time. Yeah, there's definitely some crossover there. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, this is a question specifically about Silverwood Lake. Have either of you fished there? Because this person says they've been there three times, they can't catch anything. Is there any type of bait that they can use that will kind of maybe more guarantee getting a fish? You know, I've never fished Silverwood Lake, but there's a lake near me called Folsom Lake that everyone calls the Dead Sea. Um, and I, I think people have trouble figuring that one out. And I think part of the reason they have issues is because uh, a lot of the fish, the bait fish in there are um, pond smelt, which are kind of thinner than your average lure. So you kind of want to match it more to that. Um, so people have kind of found different presentations to help, you know, catch some of the fish in there that are feeding on the smaller pond smelt. Um, so that could be part of the issue, you know, just try and figure out what those fish are naturally feeding on. So if the rare chance presents itself, you catch a fish, open up that stomach, see what it's been eating. That can usually give you a lot of good clues. Awesome, awesome. Um, so this question probably for Andrew, is it okay to bleed a fish on a kayak, like when you're in the ocean? Um, should I be worried about sharks or anything if I do that? Um, yeah, I do it all the time. You can definitely bleed a fish in the kayak. Uh, Sharks are always going to be a part of the equation, regardless. Um, but I, knock on wood, haven't run into that yet. Um, but yeah, I, ideally you'd like to bleed the fish right after you catch it so you can hopefully get as much blood out of it as possible and then ice it well. Just uh, yeah, be on the lookout, maybe. Oh, I, I don't. I'm a chicken. I will definitely <laughs> dispatch my fish, but I will not bleed it when I'm out on the salt. No way. <laughs> So um, what kind of shore fishing setup would you recommend for use while you're crabbing off the shore or a jetty? Well, is that like if I'm using a crab snare? Um, if I'm using a crab snare crabbing, I would probably just use a heavy spinning reel with, you know, probably straight braid. And that way you, you don't need much finesse when you're crabbing, if anything, contrary to that because you just need a direct connection to the snare you don't want to break it off you're usually fishing over a uh, sandy area anyways and you just want to come tight on it so you want no stretch the braid allows for no stretch so that those snares close really quickly if you're using monofilament and you have a bunch of line then you're gonna have all this stretch it's gonna stretch up to 30 percent so you don't want that i'd go straight braid straight to the snare big heavy stout rod send it out there come tight and then reel in awesome thanks um, and then another person asked, how do the tides affect like the fish you're, you're aiming for? So like surface water compared to deeper ones. So I'm guessing this person might be talking about like more shore fishing as well. Do the tides affect kind of, I guess, what kind of fish you can aim for? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I think, again, everyone has a way or a time in a tide that they like to fish. I think tides are important because you need moving water to get the fish kind of up and going. If you're fishing a bay and it's expelling all its water, it's coming and it's bringing in, you know, new feed and bait from somewhere, things are moving around. When the tide's not moving, fish are just flat. There's not much moving around in front of them. There's not much action. You need something to get them up and moving and, you know, active and feeding. Uh, I know a lot of people like fishing the last two hours leading up into the high where the tide, you know, tops out. Um, it, it's it's kind of a personal preference. I don't know. I know some guys that like fishing on the other side. Personally, I like fishing the last two up until the high. Uh, but go out and experiment and fish. Be aware. Like almost, then you can take notes, but just think like, okay, the tide tops out at two o'clock. I'm going to start fishing at 1130. If my fishing gets really good at 115, you're like, oh, it's some really good fishing right at the top of the tide. Just think about those things and it'll help you for next time you go. Did you want to add, Robin, anything to that? Uh, I was just going to say, I usually get a lot of my flatfish um, on my kayak when it's it's getting close to being stable. Um, so if it's not fluctuating wildly, I tend to do better on my flatfish. I don't know about you, Andrew, but that's been my experience. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, you guys, so much. So uh, we do have a little bit of extra time, and um, I'd want to ask both of you if you have a chance or if you want to talk about it, kind of like, what was your, like, like most memorable or favorite kind of like fishing experience like when when was it where was it 
I know we can't tell everyone where we fish, but. <laughs> well, this is a really easy one for me, Bridget. It was my very first fishing experience. I was probably five. I went out with my dad. He initially took me trolling on Folsom Lake and um, we caught one trout and he reeled it in and he felt so guilty. So anyway, after uh, we had some lunch, we went down to a different lake um, and just fished uh, bobbers and worms. He was hoping to get me to reel in a sunfish and instead this monster catfish channel cat jumped onto it and he had to reel it in again because I wasn't big enough. But um, because it was on my rod, I, I totally took credit for it. And it was, it was just great. Like we caught this monster catfish, had it for dinner Friday. Uh, I'll never forget that day. That's awesome. What about for you, Andrew? You got a favorite? A favorite. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a lot of them. There's one in particular I remember recently, uh, and I think it was just that it was a new, it was so memorable because it was a new kind of fishing I had done, and it was just one of the coolest sights I had ever seen. Uh, it was probably three or four years ago. Um, we were on the backside of Clemente. And this was when the bluefin fishing was pretty good and they were fishing uh, this thing called a yummy flyer. And it's like a rubber flying fish. It's about this big and they skip it along the surface behind the boat fishing a kite. It's kind of a complex setup, but it was the coolest thing because I remember just seeing this like flying fish, like just like skipping from like wave crest to wave crest. And uh, as it was in the air, it landed. And I just see this bluefin like, ate it right when it hit the water and it's like this fish was watching the bait in the air missed it missed it when it hit it when it hit the water and then proceeded to 150 pound fish greyhounding out of the water chasing this plastic flying fish as we're trolling it at speed and i was just like bewildered by just the amount of power that thing had to just like completely come out of the water chasing this thing and then uh kick my butt <laughs> but awesome. uh, we got it and it was awesome and that was just just uh, amazing display or display of a uh, you know power from those fish. It's great to hear you guys tell these stories because you you know you talk to you know hunters and anglers and foragers and and when they tell these these memorable stories you you see it as part of their lifestyle you know and also uh, the idea behind it being you know sustainable living like this is also a way for you to you know get your food on the table and do those great meals and recipes that you guys showed. Um, it's, it definitely is. It's amazing. So uh, we had a couple more questions come in, Robin, this one might be for you. Um, do you need to bleed freshwater fish? Uh, you know, it might improve the taste. Um, I think a lot of times that's a good technique, um, a good fast way to, uh, dispatch the fish. I don't always, um, it kind of depends on, yeah, um, where I'm at. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's, it does improve probably the quality of the meat, um, but I don't always do it. That's cool. Um, so someone said they're just getting into surf fishing um, and they're wondering if you had any tips to identify which spots underwater to target. Like, is there a way, I guess, to see from where you're fishing where to target? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> so before you even go fishing as you're walking down to the beach, I kind of like to look down and if you ever looked for like a rip current and you see where the water all kind of rips back out offshore, uh, usually that'll create, you know, some sort of disturbance or change in the bottom structure right there where the beach is. So I usually fish on the sides of those and a lot of times they'll create holes. So there's another thing, like if you go out, Let's say you go out on the low tide and you know low tide is at, I don't know, 7 a.m. You go out there and you can look at the beach and it's in its lowest tide and you look and you're like, okay, there's holes, like there's a big hole right here. When it's high tide, that's going to be full. There's going to be a bunch of fish milling around in there. It's structure. Fish need structure. And the only structure they can get on the beach is something like a hole. So if you go down there at low tide and you see there's a big hole right there and you look behind and you're like, oh, that's lifeguard station 19. Oh, perfect. Okay, I'm just to the left of it. You come back down when it's high tide. And you're like, wait, there's lifeguard station 19. I know there's a hole right there. I'm going to fish around it. Don't just fish right on top of it. Cast that up from the side, from either side, and try and fan cast and work that hole. And if you do get a fish in a spot, let's say you didn't do much, you know, scouting before, and you catch a fish in a spot, uh, it's probably because there's more fish there. So don't just catch a fish and just keep walking. Try and fish that spot a little bit more. 
um, just again, doing a little more research and reconnaissance might help out. Yeah, that's awesome too. Like having those markers, like you said, like you just, and that's obviously it's not something we can put in our tackle box, but it's something we need to be yeah. aware of, right? When we're out fishing is those markers. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, someone had asked a question regarding uh, guides for fishing. So we are gonna be providing everybody with a link um, that we have a guide locator on CDFW site that you can go on. Um, you know, they were specifically asking for you to, <laughs> to be guides, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put that out there uh, for all folks to, in your area so that you have access to someone um, that uh, can hopefully take you out. Um, one more quick question looks like it came in up, oh, which is interesting because we got asked a lot about uh, bleeding a fish. How do you bleed a fish? Is it a uh, different salt water versus fresh water? Um, I like those. <clears throat> so if you don't have anything on you, I'd just at least like pull a gill out. They have gill arches on the side. Just pull one or two of those out. Um, I bring cutters with me and they're great because I can use them to cut braid, cut line, cut everything. And they cut the grid through gills really easily too. Um, so I usually clip a few gills with my cutters and then let the fish bleed out. Do you need anything different, Robin? No, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, a knife and just uh, slitting uh, the gills is the quickest uh, way. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to emphasize that, yeah, if you don't want your catch to suffer too much, it's it's good to immediately dispatch it, whether it's, you know, um, pithing it or hitting it over the head or, or bleeding it. Um, yeah, I'm very effective, all three. Yeah, I'm glad that question came up. A lot of times during like the hunting, R3, H3s, you know, that you have those questions about, you know, worried about the animal and how to do a kill shot and create the least amount of pain, but not a lot of people always think about that with fish. So I'm glad that that really came up today and you guys were able to speak to that, you know, in such depth, thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's helpful for folks. Um, all right. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you once again, Andrew and Robin, for being here today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, I learned a ton. So thank you. I'm sure I, it sounds like everyone else did too. We had a lot of great questions come in. So for folks, if you did have um, other questions you weren't able to ask on the Q&A today, um, didn't get answered, we are going to send out a follow-up email with some really helpful links for everybody. Um, also, you can email us at the R3 statewide program at wildlife.ca.gov, which is the R3 personal email, and, and we check that all the time. So feel free to uh, hit us up there as well. Um, thanks again for all the participants and attendees being here today. Uh, check the R3 page for the upcoming uh, R3 H3 harvest huddle hours. Um, I believe our next one's gonna be an intro to turkey hunting. Um, so look for that one. So thank you again, everyone, for being here today. We really appreciate it. So go out there, get your tackle boxes ready, get that tackle going, get those lures and rigs and bobbers and everything, and, and go and have a great time. Um, feel free to, uh, CDFW loves seeing how, uh, you know, your pictures and, and everything. Feel free to send those to us, too, at the R3 page. We'd love to see uh, how you're doing and, and how this presentation helped you. Uh, thanks so much for attending today. Everyone, have a great one. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everyone.